In preparation for our business meeting after the worship service, I'd like to bring a few thoughts before you on the subject of why should I be committed to a local church? Much of what I'm about to share with you, you already know, some you may not know, but I thought it would be good to prepare our business meeting since the topic of the meeting will be primarily about the church, about Christ's Bible Church in particular, that it would be good for us to just be reminded about certain truths and doctrines and principles of the church in the Bible. Our text is Matthew 16, 18, although we will depart frequently from this text. Matthew 16, 18, where Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I would like to share three things with you. First, the nature and purpose of the church. Secondly, why church attendance is important. And thirdly, why I should be committed to a local church. Why I should be committed to a local church, which is the title of the message as well. By way of introduction, I just want to begin by mentioning some basic information about the church. The Greek word translated church is ekklesia. The root meaning of this Greek term is call out. And so the local church are the called out ones. And it implies that the church is a called out assembly. Throughout history, the church has been one of the greatest objects of hatred and attack by Satan and the world. Satan knows that the church is the bride of Christ, and he attacks her with all of his might. He knows that he can do damage to God and his kingdom if the church, the true church of Christ, the spirit-filled church, the church that accomplishes God's will and brings forth spiritual fruit, suffers or becomes weak, or the local churches go out of existence. Some of the greatest worldly conflicts occur around and through the church and the history of the world, surpassing even the political and social battles that the world has ever known. Some of the greatest conflicts have surrounded the church, whether it be the true church or the false church. In the last few years, the enemy has, in my opinion, used COVID-19 to weaken the church on a massive scale, including Christ Bible Church. I've never seen nor heard about such a rapid decline in spiritual life and strength in the church as the last couple of years, and I think most of you have observed that as well. So with that backdrop, let's go to our first point then, the nature and purpose of the church. It really surprises me and shocks me how many Christians I come into contact with who have very little clue or knowledge about the doctrine of the church. And there are even some in our own assembly that have a scanty knowledge of the church as well. But the primary thought I want to focus on concerning the nature of the church. What is the church made of? What is its essence? And what is the purpose of the church? Because there are all kinds of activities that are taking place in the church, both religious and of a physical nature. But the church is primarily organic in nature. That is spiritually organic. That is where the church needs to live to fulfill its spiritual mission in edifying one another, causing growth, and bringing forth spiritual fruit. When we depart from the organic spiritual nature, where we operate within a spiritual realm, mm. in reciprocating spiritual fruits and spiritual gifts and the Holy Spirit's edifying results of all of that, when we depart from a spiritual interchange and interaction with one another in the spirit, in the realm of the spirit, 
and switch our focus from a spiritual purpose and mission and calling to a religious one, an ecclesiastical one, a merely organizational one, we've instantly lost our focus and our purpose. Much of the church's spiritual vitality depends on its gathering together and interacting with one another spiritually, therefore. We cannot fulfill this organic calling, spiritual calling, unless we're together. And unless we perform those functions and responsibilities spiritually that God would have us to. We can gather together and still be a worldly church. We can have a very large church numerically, and our whole focus would be on physical things, confessional things, ecclesiastical things, and never have any reciprocal ministry with one another spiritually in our hearts. So we need a very specific understanding of what we're supposed to do when we gather together. We've got to have convictions about it, and we need the Holy Spirit's help to actually enter into one another's lives spiritually and edify one another to be able to accomplish God's purpose for the local church. The pragmatic and seeker-sensitive approaches to worship and church gatherings are unbiblical because they tend to diminish the proper place of spirituality and preaching and replace it with quasi-spiritual forms of sheer entertainment, music, comedy, drama, and whatnot, any trend that threatens the spiritual mission of the church in our relationship with one another, because the glory of God hinges upon us fulfilling that mission, and threatens the centrality of God's word in our church life and corporate worship is, a, is very dangerous and is to be rejected. And that's why it's very important that we have a very specific understanding of what our purpose and mission is so that we can protect it. If we don't, we'll allow things to come in so that our focus would be changed and switched to something other than the, the organic nature of the church. But one of the most disturbing side effects of a wrong view of the church's purpose is when its leaders believe they are to keep people entertained where church members become mere spectators. Just like when someone goes to a movie, they come in, they sit down, and they watch everything, and they don't engage. The architects of the modern megachurches admit that they have deliberately redesigned the worship service in order to make as few demands as possible on the person in the pew. After all, they don't want to they don't want the unchurched to be intimidated by appeals for personal involvement in ministry. They don't want to drive people away because they call the saints to serve, not just occupy a physical place. God doesn't just want warm bodies to fill pews. If he did, he could raise up stones to occupy those seats and to mouth words and lip service. To God. Such thinking is spiritually deadly. It's a death blow to the local church if we replace the organic calling and ministry of our church with something else. <coughs> Might as well remove the lampstand. So Christianity, therefore, is not a spectator sport. If you're not involved, if you're a member of the church, there's something wrong. Either permanently wrong with you or temporarily. Practically, the worst thing any churchgoer can do is to be a hearer of the word, but not a doer. Our Lord himself pronounced doom on religious people who want to be mere bystanders when it comes to his church. He said in Matthew 7 and verse 26, But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, 
and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. When it comes to our church responsibilities, we have to do them. We have to obey them. They're commands. They're not options. Something is seriously wrong in a church where the leaders do all the ministry, quote-unquote ministry. And people are made to feel comfortable as mere observers. I could tell you right now, for the last two years, Pastor Owen and I have been doing everything within our power, short of driving the sheep, to encourage you, some of you, not all of you, to stop being mere observers and to serve. One of the pastor's main duties is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. In Ephesians 4.12, it says that. Every believer is called to be a minister of some sort with the gift God has given them in the specific environment of the gathered church. In the lives, using our gifts, in the lives of other fellow church members. If you're not doing that, you're neglecting what God has commanded you to do. Because we're called to edify the body. Turn over to Romans 12, the text that our brother G read. Romans 12, verses 6 through 8. Romans 12, 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches and teaching, he who exhorts an exhortation, he who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And so, horizontally, all of these gifts are to be ministered into the lives of other church members. If you don't do that, then you're neglecting the command of God to use your gifts. But you have to do that, and the best place to do that, and the most frequent place to do that, is when the church gathers together. That's why scripture portrays the church as a body that is an organism with many organs. Now if only one or two members of a physical body are functioning, the rest of the members are just hanging there and drawing life and strength from the other parts that are being used. And so we learn that in verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 12, for in fact the body is not one member but many. Just like the human body has many members to it and each member has a specific function. It's the perfect metaphor to use to compare to the local church. There are many members and each one of us has specific gifts. And where each member has a unique role in verses 15 through 25, they all contribute to the life of the body. If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Even the most insignificant member, like a toe, is designed to play a vital role. If, role. if you lost your toe, see how fast you can move compared to your past. Ephesians 4, turn over to Ephesians 4, please. We're talking about the organic nature of the church. And you need to be asking yourself as we go through this, where am I with regard to organic service, usefulness, and participation? Am I involved in another believer's life, several believers, as a member of the local church? There may be a legitimate reason for not doing that, but it's rare. It's very, very rare. And if you are not, then you need to ask yourself why. In Ephesians 4.11, we read, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measures of the stature of the fullness of Christ. At the beginning of verse 11, he identifies two of the temporary leadership gifts that God has given to the church, the apostles and the prophets. 
And the last three gifts, and these are only some of the gifts, not all of the gifts of the church, but the remaining three are the permanent offices. I've lumped evangelist in with the other two because that's the predominant opinion of most theologians and commentators, but I'm really not sure. I'm going to go with the commentators on this one, that an evangelist is a permanent gift to the church. There's no office of evangelism, but there's the gift of evangelism or the gift of the evangelist. But the other two permanent leadership offices here mentioned here are pastor and teacher. The other final leadership office is deacon, but deacon is not mentioned here. Deacon is mentioned in a few other places. However, it's the pastor's duty, as you see in the text, to equip the saints. And it is their duty to shoulder, that is the saints, to shoulder the work of the ministry. So pastors are primarily given, and their role is primarily devoted to equipping the members, equipping the sheep, to do the work of the ministry. So the sheep are to bear the weight, the predominant weight and activity of doing the work of the ministry, beginning with the use of their gifts organically into the lives of other believers. But there are many, many, many other things that the members do in the church, in our relationship with one another, besides using our spiritual gifts, that is very critical for the growth of the body, for the sanctification of the church. So pastors and teachers are devoted to equip the saints. Also, the fruit of the pastor's, response, uh, the pastor's efforts result in the edifying of the body of Christ. So the believers and the members need to be here in the gathered church when the pastors exercise their gifts, not only in teaching and preaching, but also in interacting afterwards and beforehand with the church, getting caught up with everyone, finding out what's going on in their lives, praying with them privately and otherwise, not just at home from a telephone, seeing the brethren eye to eye, getting a sense of where they're at spiritually, getting an adjusted uh, idea of their emotions, their spirit, to see if they're discouraged, to see if they're in need. Sometimes a, a brother or a sister that I've known doesn't have to say a word to me. I know them so well. I could just look at them and I could say, so what's wrong already? There's something wrong. And I could see it in their face, in their body language. And so pastors minister that way among the sheep to encourage, to build up, to edify, to help the sheep. But you have to be there. Once a month is not good enough. Twice a month is not good enough. <clears throat> you have to be there. You have to make a commitment to do that. Why? Because how can we bounce back from discouragement, trials, affliction, where God ordained someone in the church, not, only, not just pastors and teachers and deacons, but someone else in a church with a gift to build me back up on a particular Sunday if we're not there. The pastors don't need to give permission to the members to minister to one another. If a brother or sister has a gift, that gift is naturally and spontaneously going to come out, it's going to be identified by the person, it's going to be exercised and cultivated in a natural way. But it's the pastor's duty to equip the saints. But the New Testament pattern for the local church is very clear. Every Christian is gifted and called to the ministry. The spiritual gifts we're given are not for our own sake. Let me say that again. They're not selfish in nature. The gifts that are given to the church are for other people and even God himself to benefit from. God has given us gifts so that the whole body would benefit by it. 
by the body being edified, as verse, the, uh, verse 12 says, for the edifying of the body of Christ. If you have a passing conversation with one believer one time in your whole history as a member of the church, how are you going to get to know that believer so that both of you develop a chemistry and an openness and a willingness to minister to one another so that either of you or both of you ultimately are edified? Because that's the goal of pastors preaching, pastors shepherding, pastors discipling, pastors encouraging, is for the body to be edified. And once you're edified, then usually your focus will be taken off the negative, taken off your suffering and your trials, and put on the positive, put back on the promises of Christ. You're reminded of the deliverance and preserving grace of Christ. You come out of yourselves, and you're able to go back to a positive, constructive, proactive ministry in the lives of other believers so that they can be edified. The second part of of that edification is God himself. When the saints are edified, what's the result? What's the result of a believer being edified? God gets glorified. When you're edified, it's highly likely the first thing you do is praise and thank God for that word you heard, for that encouragement, for that word of exhortation from that brother or sister, from that heartfelt expression of sympathy and concern that that brother or sister expressed to you after church on Sunday and said, thank you, brother. Thank you, sister, for sharing that. I'm going to be praying for you more intelligently now. God gets glorified. In 1 Corinthians 12, let's go back there to verse 4. 1 Corinthians 12, 4. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Who is the one that gave us these spiritual gifts? The Holy Spirit. It's expressed as the manifestation of the Spirit. And the manifestation of the Spirit is directly tied in to the diversity of gifts here. The Spirit is God. He's omniscient. He's perfect in knowledge. He not only gives the gifts, but He makes the individual believers aware of what their gift is. And He directs them and leads them and He prompts them and He moves them to exercise those gifts in the lives of other believers for the edification of the body and for the glory of God. What a, an amazing ministry of the Holy Spirit that he ostensibly holds silently in the background, though it's really not in the background, in leading and moving believers in their fellowship with one another, in their gatherings together, in the collective body. We see a powerful working of the Holy Spirit affirming the gifts he's given to individual believers and laying it heavily on their hearts in the way he leads us with his compassion and his sympathy, his insights, the spirit sensitivities to the needs of others, leading us to individual Christians to have conversations that will lead to praying for one another, expressing love and sympathy for one another, encouraging one another, and so forth. You see this powerful role of the Holy Spirit working, moving in believers' hearts and members' minds, leading members, it suggests and assumes then that you and I as fellow members are really tuned in to how the Spirit does this to keep our church spiritually organic in nature and we have a spiritual ministry with one another and therefore in the end bring forth mm -hmm. spiritual fruit redounding to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. But most of us well, let me, let me be charitable here. Some of us forgot this. Forgot all about this. Some of us didn't even realize how the Spirit works when we're really tuned into Him in this way, when we're praying for Him to actually do these things. He's the one who created the gifts. He's the one that dispensed the gifts. He's the one that leads us and opens doors for us to exercise those gifts 
For a man's gift will make room for him, Proverbs says. So this brings us to the conclusion that if he does these things through the gifts that he's given the church, if he designed the gifts for a specific purpose, to edify the church spiritually, do we have a vision? Do we have convictions along these lines? That's what we're to be doing. But if, listen, if the church doesn't gather together 90 plus percent of what God instructs us about and commands us to do concerning interaction on an organically spiritual level with one another does not get done. That means the will of God as expressed in the scriptures is not obeyed on this issue. What are you going to do with that? How are you going to respond to God with that reminder? Number two, why church attendance is important. Let me just say it very quickly and forthrightly. Church attendance does matter. Pastor Owen and I never had as a goal to have a large church numerically. We do not embrace the principles of the church growth movement. We reject Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Church, and the methodologies he purports in that book that all pastors should use. I think Satan is behind a lot of it. And it has filled a large amount of evangelical churches with unsaved people. I don't need to go door to door and take a survey in the community of Pleasanton and Dublin and Livermore and San Ramon from unsaved people how they want to do church, which is based on the premise that God's goal for his church is to have a lot of people gathered together. And therefore, all I need to do as a good businessman is adjust my ministerial methodologies to what the majority of these survey poll takers believe will get them to go to church. The church is a spiritual body. The kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We are a new covenant ministry of the Spirit. The ministers of the new covenant churches are ministers of the Spirit. The church is designed by God to be a spiritual body where we worship God in spirit and in truth. We are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. The church desperately needs its pastors and ministers to constantly call the church back and remind them that we are to have a ministry of the Spirit. But why should I go to church? Why should I go to church? You're not doing Pastor Joe and Pastor Owen a favor by going to church. We're not called to beg and plead with you that you should go to church. The, the Lord already does that in the Word. He commands you and me. The New Testament repeatedly emphasizes the importance of local assemblies. In fact, it was a pattern of Paul's ministry to establish local congregations in the cities where he preached the gospel. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 commands every believer to be part of such a local church and reveals why this is necessary. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhort one another daily, especially as you see the day approaching. We'll get more into that in a minute. Secondly, it's only in the local body to which one is committed that there can be a level of spiritual intimacy that's required 
for carefully stimulating fellow believers to love and good deeds, which is verse 25 of Hebrews 10, following the command, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Well, Paul, what's the purpose of coming together? Just to have warm bodies fill a room? No, there's a purpose. And it's stimulating fellow believers to love and to good works. When we gather together, okay, we fulfill part A of the command, but there's a part B. Part A is not an end unto itself. There's an element of quality of the command that must be fulfilled if part A is to be received by God. The whole history of Israel teaches us that even if every person in Israel gathered together and worshipped God with the right words, with the right confessions, with the right haftorah, with the right expressions, God says, rend your hearts and not your garments. God looks at the heart and not at the outward appearance. Read Isaiah 1 and many other passages where rebuke after rebuke after rebuke, and some of them led to apostasy and ultimately led to their being carried away into captivity because physically they gathered and ostensibly paid lip service to God's worship, but the quality of their worship and their motives were not where it needed to be. It was a stench in God's nostrils. It, it backfired on them completely, and they were, they were punished rather than blessed by God. And the same thing is true with the church. These church growth leaders, they're beating about the air. They're wasting their time. You can have a church of 20,000, 10,000, but that's not what God has in view. First, regeneration has to take place. We need born-again Christians who have the Holy Spirit and therefore gifted by the Spirit to do a spiritual work in a spiritual atmosphere, in a spiritual kingdom that we are not naturally equipped to do in our flesh. We need the Holy Spirit to do all of these things in and through us to be a spiritually organic church. And the organic nature of the body, spiritually speaking, needs to be renewed constantly in terms of its power, its effectiveness, and the fruits from it. Thirdly, it's only in the gathering of the body, when we attend the body, the services, in organic fellowship that we can encourage one another. It's not enough just to make a phone call. You need to be face to face with a brother or sister because there's a lot more than just words that you're communicating or you're mm -hmm. observing when you are face to face with another brother or sister who needs to be encouraged. Sometimes I'll talk with somebody on the phone and with all my 40 years as a pastor, I'll miss the point of, of what they're trying to tell me because I'm not face to face with them. Mere words won't do it. Fourth, the New Testament also teaches that every believer is to be under the protection and oversight and nurturing of the leadership of the local church. It's a command. You have to have a relationship, a spiritual relationship, with the elders of your church. Not only as recipients of their spiritual ministry and gifts, but in other ways as well. Why do you think pastors are called by God and sent into the flock and given gifts for this very purpose? If we can't even gather together consistently, how are you to benefit from a God-sent pastor or pastors for that very purpose. How are you to be edified spiritually? How are you to grow? If you don't have frequent, even weekly, bi-weekly, or twice a week, from the outward means of grace, the faithful using of the outward means of grace, which includes worship services, Bible studies, prayer meetings, 
where elders are present. God didn't just resort to plan B. He deliberately created a leadership group to edify his church, teach his church, nurture his church, and help his church because he loves his church. Christ died for his church. And when you take it upon yourself and you take the initiative to disconnect yourself from an active commitment as a member of the local church, you're hurting yourself. You're going to get weak and be subject to more temptations. Because many of you don't realize that one of the most important elements of your growth historically as a Christian is because of the elders of the churches, some of those churches, that you've been members of through the years. Mm. And pastors are called to shepherd the believer. And you can help yourself and you can help them and glorify God by receiving their encouragement, their teaching, their admonishment, as from the Lord, as long as what they say is biblical. If you don't, then you could be the source of great discouragement, not just to the church, but to the leadership of the church. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 13 with me. Hebrews 13. And verse 7. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Mm. Elders have to bear the greater burden in every category in the local church. And sometimes their example is a great encouragement, or should be, to the members. He tells you to remember them. Think about their life. Think about what they've gone through. Think about their perseverance, their faith, the trials they've been through, and God helped them survive and grow from it. But then he says in verse 17 something very, very important of Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Just because the elders come across in a gentle way, because they're very patient, even over years, as they have reminded you of areas of growth perhaps in your own life, maybe very subtly instead of being confrontational, the reminder is subtle. Doesn't mean you have the option to disobey God when they share something from God's Word with you. Are you discerning what is being said? Do you see it as coming from God? God uses imperfect men. But he says, obey them. Don't obey anything that's unscriptural. But if what they say is true and biblical and is a command of God, even if their tone or demeanor is not the best, which I can't imagine, obey because the command is coming from who? From the Lord. Now, over the last few years, the elders have sent out emails, they've made phone calls, sent texts, face-to-face, -face, pleading with the church. Mm -hmm. And in their prayer closets, weeping before God. For the members of the church to obey the Lord and come to church. And many have not obeyed. Now, a few have a legitimate reason, but not that many. What about the rest? We have 36 members of Christ Bible Church. And in the last two to three months, Owen, 
the majority of our services have seven, eight, max, ten members present. There's, a, there's a not a lot of obeying going on. Now, like I said, there are legitimate grounds. But if some of the members are always caught up in visiting other churches and attending wedding showers or baby showers, some of our people will be away three out of four Sundays because they have an active schedule. So the bottom line is just, it's going to come down to some hard choices among the members. Who are we committed to? Are we courageous and bold enough to tell family members, look, you know I'm a Christian, you know I'm a member of a local church, and if I'm not, <clears throat> if, if you plan a wedding or a, or a shower or a family event, please try to plan it on Saturday and not Sunday, because some of them I'm not going to be able to go to. And it's not because I don't love the family or love you or don't appreciate you inviting me, but I have to obey God. And there's no way I can be all things to all people. But I ha if I'm not there, you'll know why I'm not there. God says, be submissive. Verse 17. Be submissive. Why? For they watch out for your souls. The elders know because they are daily being reminded of the need for our church to maintain a high level of spiritual life. And the only way to do that is to connect with God and be refilled with the Holy Spirit. And the way God does that often is by exhorting and teaching and preaching the Word of God to the members of the church. And praying for them. We're watching out for your souls. God forbid that there would be pastors who are only concerned for the pocketbooks of the members, for the financial contributions of the members, for the physical presence of the members. I have to watch out for your soul, and I can barely shepherd my own. And before God, I have to weep genuine tears of concern before the throne of grace on behalf of your soul that you would make it to heaven one day. That's the kind of pastor I want to shepherd my soul. Because God calls me to watch out for your soul. It's not easy for me to pick up the phone or to talk to you face to face or to counsel you and bring up very sensitive spiritual issues. But God calls me to watch out for what? Your body? I'm not an MD. I'm not a doctor, a physical doctor. Oh, it looks like you're hurting there. You got a black and blue mark on your arm. Have you taken care of that? My job, although I may do that if out of concern and love, my job is to watch out for your soul. And I've got to have the courage and insight and wisdom and chutzpah from God to be able to lovingly and gently bring up topics that in your flesh you don't want me to bring up. Because it will be embarrassing, it would be awkward, it will be uncomfortable for you to talk with your pastor about your sin. But I'm called to be able to bring those, to, to, rather, to bring those things up. Because mo most of the members are not going to come to me and bring them up. Because they're ashamed. And they want their elders to think the best about them. Have we become Pharisees that we want to wear clothes that are not ours? To put on an image that really is not where we're at, spiritually? To make a good impression on me? Really? And on Owen? I'm here to watch out for your soul. I have to dig deep. I have to ask you questions. 
I have to do it in a way that would be as gracious and non-confrontational and as comfortable as possible, but there's only so much I can do to soften the blow and put my arm around you and say, I understand, brother, you're struggling with this. Let's pray about it. Let's do this. But then there's a place for exhortation. After I've shared with a brother ten times over ten years, brother, you need to make progress on this, this area of your life where you're struggling, and here's how you do it. Boom, 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 boom. And they're still struggling just as much as before. <coughs> I've got to be patient. As Christ is patient with me in my struggles, I have to be patient with others. But I have to watch out for souls nonetheless. Why? Because I'm going to give an account to God. God forbid. God have mercy upon those under shepherds who are truly called, who are going to give an account to God, but they never bring up these issues in their sermons. That is, the issues of the organic church and their commitment to the church and their service in the church and their spiritual engagement with the lives of other believers and members in the church. Because they have other agenda that's driving them. They don't want to have the numbers of their church diminish. So they're not going to bring up subjects that are touchy. They'll spend most of their time talking about apologetics issues and issues that the church faces of importance, perhaps. Our relationship with the government, the COVID-19 issues. These issues are important. But okay, how many Sundays can you preach on COVID-19? How many Sundays can you talk about pray for your political leaders? Yes, we need to take the word and apply it in a relevant way in all of our relationships. But pastors need to spend the predominant amount of their time focusing on spiritual issues that relate directly to the spiritual growth of the body. Because they're going to give an account. Think about this, Brother Carney. I'm going to give an account whether I brought up spiritual things in your life. You personally. Peter, you personally. Rob, you personally. I'm going to be held accountable. If I see something in your life that concerns me, and yes, some, most of the time I just pray about it and I wait for God to work it out, and God usually does, without having me say something, because I'm not a wolf, I'm not a domineering person. But there are times, and sometimes Owen and I, we've talked about this, we fail in the area of waiting too long, procrastinating to bring up those issues. It's not a pleasant thing to do. But sometimes we have to bring them up. But you can help us out. Look at verse 17. Look at verse 17. And Owen and I have never done this in the 25 years he's been an elder here and in the 32 years I've been an elder here. We've never said to you as a church what I'm about to say. Look at verse 17, the second half of the verse. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Now, I don't want you to take me wrong when I say this. But the church needs to know the issues sometimes, not all the time. And we never talk about it. The struggles and some of the issues that the elders are struggling with. And I'm going to speak to you now from my heart. Okay? Owen and I have been struggling off and on the last year and a half, two years in particular. Because we're at a point in our body life where the saints are not listening to us pretty much at all. We have texted, we have emailed, we have called, we have mm -hmm. cried to God, we have personally, in the most loving, gentle, compassionate way we can, through emails, explained to the church what the issues are spiritually, and also individually to some of you. But the level of hardness of heart, the level of spiritual deafness, has reached a place in our church life that we've never been at before in 32, almost 33 years as a church. And we see the results of that. 
in an attendance that has never been this low in 32 years, in some unsustainable practices, both spiritually and financially, that are, like I said, unsustainable. And a lot of it, we believe, is a direct reflection on disobeying God's command to gather together and be engaged in a spiritually organic ministry. That's, I just said it in a nutshell. And Owen and I have been grieved. And we've just dealt with our grief privately. We've encouraged one another. And we brought it before the Lord and didn't say a word to anyone. But we both agreed we need to tell you what's going on with us. And so I know that you don't want us to continue to minister to you with this grief looming over us, do you? Depression, discouragement. We're not wanting you to obey us. We're wanting you to obey God for your own edification and for your sanctification. Not for our benefit. We're called to sacrifice on levels that are indescribable without complaining and giving God all the praise and even thanking God for any affliction we experience in ministry because that's inherent in ministry that is suffering and affliction. And that's fine. So now you know something from our perspective and pray about it. We're not looking for sympathy. We're not, look, we're not, we're just telling you what's going on. And so we're at a somewhat of a crisis point at Christ Bible Church. And it, we're, we're spiritually afraid for the body because of the spiritual direction it's going. And I'm trying to look at it positively, and I know Owen is. This is the biggest test, spiritual test we faced in all of our years. And I don't know what God's will is and ultimately, but in our business meeting afterwards, we're going to get your feedback. We have not made any decisions on anything. But we're going to get your feedback because we're bringing it to you right now. We believe that the members of the church are, are the ultimate authority. Not the pastors. They're an authority. But... The combined membership of the church is the ultimate decision maker in all the major decisions of the church. The calling of an elder, calling deacon, excommunication of an errant member. All the major decisions we see in scripture are made by the cumulative gathered body. And so the church, when we bring the issues to you that we're going to bring at the business meeting, ultimately is going to make the decisions. And these are some pretty serious decisions. Lastly, and I'll hurry along here, why should I be committed to a local church? Because number one, we're commanded to gather together. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Yeah. Number two, because we have a commitment, we're supposed to have a commitment to serve. God's not calling us only to observe, but to serve. To be actively, not passively, but actively involved. And God has equipped us with gifts and other skills to actually benefit others and glorify himself. So it's an active serving, not a passive serving. Are you committed to that? First you have to come. You have to be here. And when we talk about serving, it's not just occupying a chair. You're not doing the pastor a favor by coming to church. Serving is to be motivated by the Holy Spirit in you. There's a lot of things I appreciate about, uh, appreciate about all of you. One of the things I appreciate about Janet Brown is the initiative she takes in serving. The 
cards, the letters, and it's not just a birthday once a year. She's written down many other important dates in the lives of other people. I'll get a, I don't know, I got an anniversary card one, one time. I got this card. I got, it's a means of encouragement. She's our church historian. She's got this book, this photo book, going back how many years? 30 years? Something like that? Of the history of Christ Bible Church. She brings it to events. Her role in the ladies' prayer group is critical. Is very encouraging. The elders didn't command her to start a ladies' prayer group and to do all these things. The Holy Spirit working in her. She didn't know I was going to use her as an example, and I'm sorry, sister, if I embarrassed you. But that's what I'm talking about when we talk about serving. And I can give examples in the lives of many of you. We're to make a commitment to Christ Bible Church because it's a commitment to spiritual uh, uh, ministry to others. Spiritual ministry to others. There's a phrase the Bible uses 59 times. It's called one another. There are 59 texts in the New Testament that use the phrase one another. I'm going to remove those the, the phrase one another ink from those texts that even uh, slightly may not apply to what I'm talking about when I talk about commitment to an organically spiritual ministry in the lives of other believers. And what I come up with after that is 28 phrases that directly relate to spiritual ministry to one another. It's, uh, I'm going to read these very quickly. We, and I'm not going to give you the scripture references. If you want the scripture references, for the sake of time, I won't. Let me know and I'll send you my outline. We're, we're told, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Second, honor one another above yourselves. Third, live in harmony with one another. Accept one another, just as Christ accepted you. Instruct one another. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Have the same care for one another. Serve one another in love. Bear one another's burdens. Be kind to one another. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Submit to one another. Bearing with one another. Teaching and admonishing one another. Increase and abound in love to one another. Comfort one another with these words. Comfort each other and edify one another. Exhort one another daily. Consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Exhorting one another. That's 20. Seven or eight more. Confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another. Have compassion for one another. Have fervent love for one another. Be hospitable to one another. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. Be submissive to one another. Some of these are doubles, but they're found two or three times. That's 27. I'll not, I'll not use the, there's, because there's 13 times scattered throughout the New Testament, five New Testament books, where the phrase love one another is found. 13 times over five books in the New Testament where we're commanded love one another. How can you do that if you're not here? How can you do all those things? How can you do this one anothering ministry that we all have in each other's lives? using all of these amazing synonyms and adjectives to describe this organic union and interaction we're to have in each other's lives. Are you committed to that? You have to spend a lot of time with each other to be able to fulfill all these commands. 
but you can't accomplish the doctrine and practice of one anothering on social media, can you? <coughs> Let me say this, Zoom church is not a church. But when we look at some of the videos on Facebook and YouTube and so forth, half the membership are engaging with CBC on Zoom and not in person. Is that a reflection of laziness or a lack of commitment or a lack of knowledge about the doctrine of one anothering and organic union? Mm. Zoom is watching a screen. There's nothing about that that fulfills the biblical definition of coming together. Now, Zoom has its place. Social media has its place. I'm not saying if you partake of some spiritual teaching or you, preaching or on, on social media, it's sin. I'm not saying that. But social media is not to usurp the place and take the place of in-person worship, in-person prayer meetings, mm -hmm. in-person Bible studies. The definition of a church is very clear in the New Testament. They came together on the first day of the week. They came together. They gathered together on the first day of the week to engage in some very important spiritual activities like partaking of the Lord's Supper. When was the last time you partook of the Lord's Supper? Why? If, it wasn't, if it's not been for a long time. Is it because spiritually you were struggling? Or it's because you would have partaken of it if you were there? The church worshipped the Lord. They prayed. It was fellowship. Acts 2.42 and they continued steadfastly in the Apostles' doctrine, in fellowship, in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Those are all intensely spiritual activities that are to be done in person with one another and between them and the Lord. We are only the church when we are together. Now, that's the local church. There's the universal church, but we'll not get into that. The church is the church when it corporately worships, when it corporately prays, when it corporately hears the preaching of the Word of God, when it corporately partakes of the Lord's Supper. It is only in the local body to which one is committed, that there can be the level of intimacy that's required for carefully stimulating fellowship and fellow believers to love and good deeds. It is only in this setting that we can encourage one another. Because spiritual growth requires diligence in using the outward means of grace. The, out, the inward means of grace is Bible reading, prayer, meditation on the word. The outward means of grace is church attendance, partaking in the Lord's Supper, praying with the believers. How can we cut all that outward means of grace out of our life or be disinterested or bored with it? You see, the local church, listen, is designed to play a significant role in your spiritual life. If the local church is not having a spiritual impact in its ministries and with the outward means of grace, why not? And when you anticipate going to church for a meeting, a Bible study, a prayer meeting, are you bored already before you get there? Do you have a lackadaisical or... Um, indifferent attitude about going? Or do you look forward to going to church 
and partake of the outward means of grace? Is there an excitement, a joy? If you have an indifferent attitude about it, it could be that there's something going on in your spiritual life that's not right. Because everyone who I know, including myself, that's been walking with God, that's had fresh grace poured out, looks forward to going to the gathered assembly of believers to partake of the outward means of grace. I just love it when Brother Carney stands up and says, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. <coughs> I'm excited. Now, apart from the superlatives he uses to describe it, I know that this brother's been walking with the Lord recently, that very morning, mm -hmm. because he's been freshly stirred up to anticipate a blessing that God is going to give him in fellowshipping with other believers and hearing the word of God and feeding his never dying soul and partaking of the Lord's Supper and being drawn to Christ through that mysterious but unique ordinance that God has given us to go deep with Christ and push a reset button with Christ in our relationship with God. But if you are indifferent about, well, you know, I love my church, I'm a member of CBC, but what church will I go to today? Let's see. It's like a, uh, like a menu at a Chinese restaurant. Let me pick one from column A and one from column B and one from column C. Are you a member of a church or not? It's not wrong to visit another church once in a while for a special event or something. But have you done so much in your participation in a, lo a local church where you are a member to edify the body, to build up the body, to get to know the strengths and weaknesses of the body so you can pray about them constantly and be so spiritually active and plugged in and unified and engaged with a large amount of the members of the body that you have the luxury frequently, frequently to go to some other church. Some of us have completely missed this perspective. Because if the local church is designed to play an important role in your spiritual life, in most cases, the local church is the primary source of Bible teaching for you and worship and discipleship and accountability and admonishment and encouragement and fellowship. Consider the vital role the local church plays in spiritual growth. And it's a wonder that so many Christians don't feel the need to identify with a specific congregation through church membership. Rather than just planting themselves with one church body and developing deep spiritual roots, too many Christians outside of this body seem content to just drift among multiple congregations, landing wherever they feel their needs and interests are best served. Are best served. This consumer-driven approach contradicts the New Testament model for the church and bypasses the Lord's design for spiritual growth and leadership. It also cripples the believer's usefulness to the Lord and to the body of Christ. If our members are all over the map in their relationship with local churches, how, it's not about you. What about the other believers that are missing out on the receiving end of your spiritual gifts? And God using you to edify the body where you are a member. You know, it's in the gathered church that I learned how to live the Christian life. I've been a Christian 47 years. And the first church I became a member of, the first church I attended, the church I was baptized in, established a profound, solid foundation in my life. So that in the future, I could never imagine myself not being a member of a local church. The local church, the body life, had that big of an impact on me. The gathered church taught me how to love believers. It taught me how to serve the Lord. 
The gathered church set the standards for my life. The local church is where I met my wife. God provided a, church, a wife for me through the local church. It was there that I experienced the life of the church. Come into contact with the spiritual life of other believers. And me responding in my thoughts, wow, this guy must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at this love just oozing from him. I have never seen such love. It was in the local church that I raised my children. And by his grace did what God told me to do. Raise your child in the way that he should go. And when he grows old, he will not depart from it. And my children were greatly impacted by the environment of the local church that I insisted I bring them to week after week after week after week. And I look at my children and I see how God has honored what my wife and I have done in consistently bringing our family to church, making a huge commitment. Well, you're the pastor. I'm a believer. My convictions came from somewhere. I was not always a pastor. What if I, as a pastor, decided I'm going to take a break today and I didn't tell anybody and I just wanted to take a break and then I began to make a habit of it. Eventually the church would have to have a meeting over it when they found out what Pastor Joe was doing and you would hold me accountable. Would you not? Would you not hold me accountable if I just didn't show up whenever I did? The flesh said, Joe, don't go to church today. You feel, you feel a little uh, off. You don't think you're going to preach well. You, you're just, you're tired. You've had a 70, 80 hour week, and Joe, you know, just take a break. Mm. Do some of you think like that? But I made a commitment. I'm going to go anyway, even if I don't feel like it, because God commands me to. Mm. I'm going to go to my church. Yeah, my church isn't perfect. It has its struggles and its needs. But show me one that is. Show me where the grass is greener somewhere else, where you will find no problems, no defects, that are always, for the lifelong history of a local church, in the process of growing, in the process of reforming, in the process of making these spiritual adjustments. That's the nature of the church. We are a work in progress, every local church. So let's find a church God is leading us to, if we're not members of a church, Plan our feet there and stay there unless they apostatize, unless they really cross the line doctrinally and otherwise. Other than that, stay there and you don't look at other people and don't measure or compare yourself to other people or the, your church with its weaknesses to other churches and think, I wish I was there because once you get there, after a month and the honeymoon is over or two months or a year, all of the problems and defects are going to be seen for what they are. And you're going to look back and say, I should have stayed where I was. And you're going to be able to appreciate the previous church more than you ever had before. I've gotten so many phone calls from former members through the years, through 32 years, who have looked at Christ Bible Church through this very narrow prism. And they're very negative sometimes, and they're bringing up all the faults with the church. And, and I'm trying to explain to them, yeah, we, we have faults. That's why it's a lifelong process of growth. When, things bring thing, when people bring things to me, I seriously look at it, and I deal with them if I'm able to. But there's an element of growth in a church with its problems and defects. You have to wait on the Lord to make the changes, to improve things, to help people grow. Well, I have these needs, I need this program, I need that program, I need the single program, I need the, the children's program, I need the children's nursery. Do you need that to be fulfilled as a believer? Do you need that to feel like you're... It's not about your needs, it's, a, it's about getting fed the Word of God, using your gifts to edify the body, and being involved spiritually in other people's lives.
It's in the local church that I found the intimate circle of my lifelong friends. I am still in close fellowship with <coughs> believers I've known for 47 years. Some of them are those who discipled me the first couple of months after my conversion. And I appreciate them now more than ever. It's, it's here, yeah. it's in the church that I've given my entire life. So I'm committed with all my heart to the church. Are you? And it's a total commitment of my life. It's more important to, to me than most other things. And it takes a lot, a lot. I have to have a really important reason why I don't come to church. Really important. As soon as I could, as soon as I could be declared a believer and make my public profession of faith and was baptized, I became a member of the church. With all of the responsibilities that went along with it. And by God's grace, I was faithful to the church. I didn't know any other life. I didn't know any other way than to be totally committed to the love and life of the church of my Lord Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ died for the church. If he gave up his life for the church, it includes also his desire to see the church grow. The church is the bride of Christ. He's jealous for the spiritual purity and growth and holiness and sanctification of the church. In the church, I look at the church and the diversity, but I say, these are my people. These are my peeps. If I could use another expression. I don't identify with the world. As imperfect as the church is, these are my people. They understand me. They understand my afflictions because we go through the same or similar things. Amen. Where else am I going to go? Who else am I going to talk to to bear my soul, confess my faults, and have someone comfort me in my spiritual trials? My mother? My Jewish mother? I love her with all my heart. But my people in the local church, I can go to. Any one of them. And they will sincerely put their arm around me and comfort me and pray with me. This is my family. My family. These are the ones that God has brought into my life for my own spiritual benefit and blessing and the ones I am to serve. That's the only way I ever understood the church. It was everything in my life. But we have a very different kind of attitude in evangelicalism today. For many, commitment to the church is at an all-time low. Not only because of the effects of COVID. But that's partly the fault of so-called churches that don't require anything. There are churches that don't require anything. There are vast numbers of churches that ask for nothing except for money in the offering. They're not expecting membership. The leaders are not expecting membership. Many of them don't even have such a thing as membership. They don't expect you to conform to a certain doctrinal statement. Many of them don't even have a doctrinal statement, period. They don't even have some kind of creedal articulation of the truth. And they don't expect you to be accountable to elders and leaders who watch out for your souls. They don't expect people to have that kind of accountability because that, they fear that that will drive people away. The lead, those leaders don't want to make another... They don't want to have to minister to people on that level because they know the level of commitment and sacrifice 
that they will have to invest emotionally and time-wise and in tears if they take on another five members. So if we have somebody walk through the door who visits us, before God, I have to be just as interested and concerned about this stranger than any of you. I have to reflect the attitude and mind of Christ. There was a time when coming to Christ, believing in Christ, meant joining the church and belonging to a church and being faithful to a church and being part of the life of the church and growing together with the people in that local assembly, that local congregation. And the fellowship of believers was a permanent identification between them and the church. All of that has changed dramatically. People bounce around from event to event. We talk a lot about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as if that's the end all and be all of Christianity. But we never talk about a corporate relationship to Jesus Christ, do we? Not that much. But the Bible doesn't talk about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, it uses maybe other words to describe salvation. But the Bible talks about a corporate relationship to Jesus Christ. The Bible doesn't depict us as all kinds of individual people isolated in a relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, when you become saved, you are placed by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. And it's far better to say I'm part of those who belong to Christ than to say I have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. As if that in itself is some kind of a self-contained, fully satisfying relationship when it is not. The reality of low commitment is manifest in the contemporary evangelical scene in a number of ways. I'm going to just finish this one small point, then I'll be done, though I have some more material here. Too much material, obviously. Low commitment in contemporary evangelical Christianity. It's seen in the Christian media where so many believers are committed to going on their iPad or their iPhone and see what kind of music's there. And they're really committed to that. Every day they'll check and they'll go to their sources that they use for music and so forth. They'll tune into their radio program on Christian radio. They'll watch their Christian television programs. And it's like they become consumers. Totally detached from the local church with spiritual engagement among the members. They become isolated. So many today are isolated. They're independent. They're, they're personal viewers or listeners of Christianity. They are viewers or listeners of Christianity without being participants in the reality of the life of the church. They don't feel attached to a church. They feel it might be intrusive. It might be demanding if they become a member of the church. It might expose them a little bit. Their attendance tends to be irregular and fragmented. They're again ecclesiastical consumers. As such, they neglect the ordinances of the church, the regular ordinances of the church. The Lord's Supper, they haven't been baptized yet. They're not exposed to the privilege of hearing the testimonies of people who have been baptized, seeing the Lord add to the church. They're not regularly engaged in the table of the Lord, breaking bread at His table and being conf confronted as to their own sin. They don't participate in those things in a regular routine way as they are commanded to do in the Word of God by the Savior Himself. People could attend churches for months and months and never participate in the Lord's table. God says, do this until I come. The development of Christian media, Christian personalities, national personalities, mm -hmm. Christian personalities on the media, 
on television, on radio, and the development of Christian music and social media for many has become a substitute for the church today. Does it bother you? You're not seeing, or rarely seeing, let me say it that, you rarely see a model picture of what a local church is supposed to function like. And the examples that all these young people and young couples and even older couples are getting by observing these independent-minded mavericks getting all their Christianity through media outlets without having that organic, personal engagement with others is not the image we should be sending to the average person. And therefore, since most churches are very superficial in their teaching, they're not being taught the doctrine of the church to counterbalance this false image they're receiving from the media. They have no clue about the commitment they should have to the local church. And the emotional stimulation coming through the very clever means of media outstrips in dramatic communication what happens in the church. <coughs> and so there's been a paradigm shift in evangelicalism. And it's gone from the local church and the shepherds in the local church to the media and the parachurch. And there are some who perceive the church as a threat of some kind. If the church threatens you, if being a member of the church threatens you, then something isn't right in your life. Does it threaten you because you're holding on to sin that you don't want exposed? That's what God designed the church to do and its leaders, to bring that out so they can deal with it and get right with God again. Does it threaten you because you might be given responsibility or somebody might have an expectation of you and you don't want to make that commitment? It's not your choice to make that commitment or not. Does it threaten you because you're unwilling to offer your life in service and love? Does it threaten you because you don't want to use the gifts you've been given? Does it threaten you because you don't want to give and invest of yourself and your resources to others? In all those things, rather than bringing joy to you, they threaten you. You might want to ask yourself if you're a Christian, if you really are a Christian. There may be a degree of ignorance as to our relationship to the church. I, I grant that. I, and I grant that it's very possible because there's so much going on in the name of church that misrepresents the church. I know there are a lot of people who don't even understand the importance of becoming a part of the church in a biblical way because they've never been taught that. And I understand that the kind of culture in which we live is so individualized and that we can become so self-sufficient in this culture. We say, why do we need the church? They're just a bunch of hypocrites anyway. But from a socio-economic viewpoint, some say, we don't need anybody. And so it's a hard transition to put ourselves in the spiritual position of recognizing how desperately we need one another and are needed by each other as well in spiritual engagement. So I just want to encourage you, now that we understand what a church is supposed to be, the commitment to, the, to be a member of a local church, the critical importance of attending all the meetings for your own spiritual benefit and that of others and for the glory of God, I want to encourage you to become responsible to be really a spiritual part of the church as a member. Paul told the Ephesian elders, you have the responsibility to shepherd the church of God that he purchased with his own blood. 
How can we shepherd the church of God if we don't know who the church is, if the church is not committed, if the church is not committed to Christ, if the members are not committed? Last sentence I'll say. Jesus Christ was committed to you when he died on the cross for you, to save you. Are you committed to him as a member of Christ Bible Church? Father, thank you for the patience and the grace you've given everyone today to bear up, and to bear with the word of exhortation. Help us now as we take a short break and then have our business meeting. Be with us. Give us wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's take a short break and come back at 